It's amazing what God is doing and how God is at work around us all of the time. And I just want to begin tonight by saying thank you for joining us. And for those of you that are new believers in particular, thank you that you are ready to begin the journey of continuing to build your relationship with Jesus Christ. Once we come to Jesus Christ and we recognize him as Savior, he wants us to learn to follow him. And that's what we want to help you do. So over the next five weeks, I'm going to be teaching in an atmosphere that is going to be helping you to know how you can disciple a new believer. The handouts, the materials that is available, you can download, you can keep them, you can use them. As people come to Jesus Christ, your friends and families, I strongly recommend that you disciple them in your homes. You disciple them in their homes. You have an atmosphere, an environment that they are familiar with where they can learn things like how to read the Bible, how to worship, how to pray, how to be able to build relationships with other believers. And so as we're going through this together, please understand that the lesson tonight is not only to teach new believers their beginning walk with Christ, but also how that you as an existing long-term believer can now disciple new believers. Each one of us were called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. A disciple of Jesus Christ is literally one who obeys what Jesus told us to do. In being obedient to what Jesus has told us to do, that includes go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them and teaching them to obey everything that I taught you. So this is why discipleship is very important. We don't just go out and make converts. We are helping people become long-term followers of Jesus Christ. And so let me just say to those of you that are new believers, welcome to the kingdom of God. We are so glad that you have received him. God is at work around us. Uh, it's amazing to me, during this time of the pandemic, statistically we have been able to notice that more people are attending church through live streams than were attending churches by going to church buildings in this past six weeks. Isn't that wonderful? People have had family members that were not going to church with them that are now joining them in their living rooms to watch live stream services, and many of them have come to Jesus Christ. Several churches have been sharing testimonies of people who have responded both online live asking for prayer or notifying their churches that they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. So I want you to know that God is at work around us. He loves this world. He is aware of our circumstances. He knows what we need. And because of that, he's prepared specifically tonight to speak to you. Just as he spoke to you at the time that you received him as your Savior, he wants to speak to you again tonight. Would you just join me in a word of prayer? Let's just invite Jesus and invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us tonight. Father, you're so good to us. You are so, so good to your children, and we love you. We thank you so much that, that you have prepared in your all-sufficiency everything that we need. You love us so much that you came looking for us and you found us and now you want us to have a loving relationship with you. Father, we just give you the glory and the honor because you and you alone are the one that has done this. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you for making the way for us to come to the Father. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place right now because you are the true teacher. You are the true speaker in this place. Let the words that we speak and the mind that we have over this next 45 minutes, let it be the mind of Christ that you can speak to us and reveal yourself to us. And we thank you again. We thank you, Father, for making this time available for us. And we give it to you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul and all of our strength to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you did the handouts that, I've, that I provided to you, you'll notice that there are some areas for a text and questions and answers. We want every new believer to understand that God still speaks to us as individuals. And as we read his word, God is speaking to us. So as we read his word, he also wants us to meditate on his word, to think about what he's saying and respond to what his word is saying. 
Now, every single one of us, even those of us who have been serving for many years, need to know that God's not interested in us just sitting down and reading the Bible through in a year. He's not interested in our just reading through and passing quickly over what he's saying. He wants us to recognize that when we open his word, we are opening his house. When we are opening his word, we are opening his heart. When we are opening his word, we are opening a dialogue with him. Where we are saying not only, God, are we going to read what you spoke, but we want to hear what you're speaking to us today. So if you have a Bible, go with us to the book of Luke. Now, if you're a new believer and you don't have a Bible, we want to help you have a Bible. So all you need to do is just type right in there on your computer, wherever you're at. If you can send us a comment that says, yes, I need a Bible, we will help make sure that you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible available, you can also use your mobile phone. There are many, many Bible apps that you can download for free. But it's very important that you have access to a Bible and that you read it. Over the next five weeks, you're going to practice what it's like to read Scripture and then to be able to understand it by not just reading through it, but reading to it. Let's begin reading from Luke chapter 19, chapter, verses 1 through 10. And this is a story about a man named Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to read it for you. Now, usually when I'm discipling new believers, we usually have about three to five that are gathered uh, at a table together. And I will have one of the new believers read it out loud. And we read through it twice. So I'm going to read it. You follow along with me from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is gone to be with the guests of sinners. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, that's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story. And, and I remember even as a child in, in Sunday school and in children's church, I remember, I don't know how many of you remember the flannel graph boards that you, you had. And I remember the flannel graph uh, lessons that they would have. And Zacchaeus would be up in the tree and, and we would go. But it's a wonderful story. But it's a story of salvation. It's a story about salvation. It's a story about you. It's a story about you. Now, I'm going to read it one more time, but as I'm reading it, I want you to put yourself into the relationship of Zacchaeus. I want you to not just read the, or hear me reading the scriptures, but hear the relationship that takes place between Zacchaeus and Jesus. Notice what happens. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and at once he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look here and now. I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too 
is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now as we read this text, let's ask ourselves a few questions. Because our lesson today is this, I have a surrendered heart. I have a surrendered heart. In fact, I want you to learn that. Just put your hands over your heart right now and just lift them up and say, I have a surrendered heart. And, and that's what you're saying by receiving Jesus Christ. I have a surrendered heart. Question number one, what was Zacchaeus doing? What was Zacchaeus doing? Well, if we read, and, and, and if we were alone together, five or six of us at a table right now, I would stop and I would give you time to write down your own answer. Because it's very important that you not wait for me to give you the answers. God is speaking to you. I don't need to tell you what God wants to speak to you. See, five of us could be sitting together and read this, and each one of us sees something a little bit differently because each one of our lives are lived a little bit differently. So I would wait for you to answer the question. But then I would point out some very specific characteristics. First of all, we notice that he wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Because of limitations, because of physical stature, and because of the crowd, so there was both physical and there were environmental things that were preventing him, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. He was investing himself in trying to get into the position to be able to see who Jesus is. He knew that Jesus was coming that way. Now, what I find remarkable about this, remarkable about this is that he was looking for Jesus. Zacchaeus had heard something about Jesus, and there was something about him that was drawing him to him. Just like you as a new believer, just like each one of us at one time, we were drawn to this man Jesus. There was something in our life that, that needed to change, and that's what this is all about. Something in our life was not working. Maybe we were having a crisis of health or a crisis of economy. Maybe a relationship was broken. Maybe we lost a very dear family member. Whatever the circumstance was, something began to compel you to recognize your life was broken. Your world was broken. I need to see who this man Jesus is. But notice Zacchaeus wants to hide from him. It's not enough that Zacchaeus wants to see him. He doesn't want Jesus to see him. So he hides up in a tree. Rather than as a wealthy man, as a tax collector, making his way through the crowd and saying, hey, 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 you know who I am. Let me get through. I want to get to that man, Jesus. I want him to know. No, that's not what he did. He, he, he hides. And, and then because he even more doesn't want Jesus to see him, he climbs up in the tree. But Zacchaeus knows there's something drawing him to Jesus. Question number two, what did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? What did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? I love the way that the word says that when he came to the spot, when Jesus reached the spot, he knew the location. He knew exactly where to stop. You know, that, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, even in Jesus Christ at that time, that the divine place, the divine appointment, here is the place. And Jesus, whether or not he knew Zacchaeus from before or not, some believe that Zacchaeus may have known Jesus or heard about Jesus, or perhaps Jesus saw Zacchaeus before. Specifically, if you will recall, those of you that uh, have been going to church for a long time, you remember when Matthew was called to follow Jesus, Matthew was a tax collector. And what did Matthew do? Matthew had a big dinner, and he invited Jesus to come, and he also invited all of the other tax collectors. And so it's very possible that Zacchaeus had heard about this man, Jesus. However it came about, Jesus finds the spot, and he says to Zacchaeus, come down immediately. He doesn't say to Zacchaeus, I want you to go home and get ready because I'm coming over. He doesn't say, Zacchaeus, take your time. I've got to finish with the crowd. I've got something else I'm doing right now. No, he says, I'm stopping now. Immediately, I'm reaching up to you. I want you to come down. I must stay at your house today. Now, he's telling Zacchaeus, I have an appointment with you. I have an appointment with you. I love this because Jesus is looking for Zacchaeus. Jesus is looking for Zacchaeus. Now, let me just pause here to tell you this. Jesus was looking for you. You didn't find Jesus he found you. 
As interested as you were in who Jesus is and what you've heard about him even when you were growing up or from other people, the truth is he was looking for you the whole time and he found you. And when he found you, he said, I want to go home with you. He didn't say, I just want to save you in your place of crisis. He didn't say, I just want to save you for the moment. I I don't want to just deal with where we're at right now. I'm going to come home with you because I I want to come and stay with you. And I want you to know that as a new believer in Jesus Christ, he wants to come and stay with you. What did Jesus, what did Zacchaeus then say to Jesus? So, so now we've moved on. We are at Zacchaeus' house. Jesus is there. He's in, Zacchaeus has invited all of the other possibly tax collectors. And notice what the crowd says about Jesus. Notice if you would look at verse number 7. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus was going to be the guest in Zacchaeus' house. Isn't it interesting that Jesus invited himself over? I like that. I do that quite often. I enjoy telling people, by the way, I would love to come have dinner with you. I'll be there Thursday night. I was talking this afternoon with Pastor Greg. We were texting one another as he was sharing with me the pictures of his breakfast this morning. After he shared with me the pictures of his lunch at Makayo's yesterday. Makayo's, Manuel's, I'm not sure. Manuel's yesterday. Pretty Donna is here and she's, she's telling me. So I told him this afternoon, I said, I said, you need to tell Pretty Donna I want to go have dessert after we finish our, our class tonight. So, hey, I, don't, I have no problem saying, hey, I'm going to come be your guest. I'm going to come hang out with you. Jesus does not want to pass you by. He's not interested in just just forgiving you of your sins. He wants to change your life. Think about that for a moment. He wants to change your life. Because of that, Zacchaeus says to Jesus, he stands up in the crowd. Everybody's watching him. Everybody's looking at him. All of his friends, all of the public, they're watching him. Probably some of the crowd followed all the way on with Zacchaeus and Jesus onto Zacchaeus' house, hoping that maybe they could get some free lunch, some free food, hang out with the, with the crowd. But, but, but now we find that Zacchaeus, something inside of him is stirred up. Something inside of him is unsettled. Something inside of him causes the truth to rise up in him. And he's compelled, he's compelled by something to stand up and make a confession. And he confesses to everybody, look, look, Lord. And and, and again, this is an amazing thing. He immediately refers to Jesus as Lord. Now, why would he refer to Jesus as Lord, except that he's recognized that there's something about this Jesus that has authority over him? There's something about this Jesus that can change his life that can bring authority over the circumstances of his life. That's why he calls him Lord. And then notice what happens. Here and now, I give half of my possession to the poor. Whoo! Wow! Half of my possessions to the poor. Now, don't you know there were some poor people there ready to claim their portion? You know, there's always someone around to try and get their piece of the pie. But then he goes on a little bit further. Even more compelled by this, he makes this statement, and if... Now, I want you to notice something about and if. He says, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, Zacchaeus knew he had cheated people. There was no doubt about it. You see, you and I in our humanness, you and I in our nature, you and I coming to Jesus Christ, we don't like to confess our sins. We don't like to admit what we know we've been doing wrong. And so we come to Jesus and we say things like, and if I've done anything to offend you, you know you have. And if there's sin in my life, you know there's sin in your life. Zacchaeus is trying to, 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 to respond to this change that's taking place. And, and, and maybe he even doesn't realize how much money he just spent. Maybe he doesn't realize what just flew out of his mouth. But he was so moved by Jesus in his presence, he surrendered his heart. He surrendered his heart. This was no longer about his wealth. This was no longer about his home. This was no longer about Zacchaeus. This was no longer about what he had. This was about Jesus. I'm going 
to give to the poor, I'm going to repay anyone that I've cheated four times what I've taken from them. Now listen, Zacchaeus admits, he repents, he admits that he's done wrong, he admits that he's sinned. Every single one of us have to confess what our sins are. We have to be able to admit what he told us to stop doing. Understand that. When he forgives us of our sins, we must confess, we must repent, we have to be able to articulate what that sin is to him. Notice that Zacchaeus is telling everyone, he wants everyone to know that his life has just changed. What did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? What did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? He looks at Zacchaeus, but he speaks to the crowd. Now listen to me. He looks at Zacchaeus, but he speaks to the crowd. I want you to understand that the work that God is doing in you, the salvation of Jesus Christ, he does in you, but he speaks to everything about you. He does it in you, but he speaks to everything about you. It gets reflected to everyone and everything about you. Today, salvation has come to this house. Now, I don't know. I, I read it. You've read it. I don't see anywhere where, where uh, Zacchaeus prayed a specific prayer, where he did anything religiously required. He simply recognized that he was wrong and Jesus was right. He recognized that there was something in his life that he needed to stop doing and there was something that he needed to start doing. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, it's not just going to change you. It's going to change everything about you. Salvation has come to your house. And he tells the rest of the crowd. He said, this man too is the son of Abraham. But then he goes on. And, and the reason he makes that statement is because he wants people to know that even their life can be changed. Anyone who's a child of Abraham. Anyone who's a child of Abraham could become like Zacchaeus. They could have salvation come to their home. And Jesus says this to him. He says, I've come to seek. The Son of Man, speaking of himself, has come to seek and to save those that are lost. You know what that tells me? That tells me that before Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus, Jesus was looking for Zacchaeus because he knew that he wanted to change Zacchaeus' life. And Zacchaeus would have the ability to minister to others, to change other people's lives. So we come to these two questions. Question number one, what is Jesus speaking to you today? What is Jesus speaking to you today? As you read about how Zacchaeus came to accept Jesus as his Lord, what about you? What is he speaking to you that he's saying to you, hey, I want to change your life? What are some of the things that you know that God wants to change about you? Maybe he wants to help you turn from bitterness to joy. Maybe he wants to turn you from being a deceiver to being a life giver. Maybe he wants to change you from being an angry person to being a person of love and compassion. Maybe he wants to speak to you today to let you know that you don't have to go back to that old group of friends that gave you identity and gave you, well, a wrong life. But now you can walk with Jesus Christ. He can change your future. He can change your hope. He can change the direction that you're going in. The second question is this, what will you say or do in response to Jesus? Right here, right now, what will you do differently? What can you say right now? And I'm talking to all of us, those who are new believers in Jesus Christ and those who have been serving Him for a long time. What is He speaking to you today that He wants you to stop doing and He wants you to start doing? Maybe you stopped teaching a class. Maybe you stopped witnessing to your neighbors. Maybe you stopped praying for the lost. Maybe you stopped having a burden for those things. Maybe you felt that you have grown too old or you're not experienced enough or you haven't read the Bible enough. All, you can come up with all kinds of excuses, but I'm just asking you right now, what is God speaking to you right now? What is He saying to you? And what will you do in response? What will you do in response? Now, as we close our lesson today, and as you consider those thoughts, I want to affirm to you your salvation. 
as a new believer, it's very easy for other thoughts to enter into our mind, for our routines to come back into place, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in the late hours watching things we shouldn't watch, reading things we shouldn't be reading, desiring things that we said we weren't going to do anymore. Again, we're coming back to that changed life. We're coming back to that place. And, and here's how we begin to, to realize that we do have a changed life. And here's what I want you to know. Today you have been born again. Today you have been born again. If like Zacchaeus today you have recognized and you said, Lord, I belong to you. I give you my heart. If I've wronged anybody, if I've done anything to offend others, if there are things in my life that I know I need to stop doing, I'm going to stop doing it right now. I'm going to stop doing it right now. And I'm going to start doing the things that you're telling me to do. I'm going to become obedient to you. You are no longer what you used to be. You are a new creature. You are a new life. You are beginning your new life today. And that's what becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ is about. It's about a changed life that begins a course of living their life differently, learning to follow Jesus. How do I know this? How do I know this? Well, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 tells us that. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? He also says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. You have eternal life. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 tells us that. But I want to share with you four things before we go. I want to share with you four things in particular to confirm to you your salvation. Again, you can go out online, you can download these documents, and you can keep them. You put them someplace where you can read them. When you feel as if though your, your strength is failing, you're growing weak, and you're wanting to go back to some old ways, maybe you even find that you found yourself falling. You've already gone back. It's not too late for you to return to Jesus. You can always come to Him, confess that He's right, Admit that you're wrong. But you have to be specific in your repentance. It cannot be a vague, general repentance. See, see when you do that, then you're, you're deceiving yourself. You have to confess what you know you've been doing wrong. You have to be able to admit it to Jesus, believe that He will forgive you, and then stop doing that. Here's the first thing. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. John chapter 3 and verse 37. If you come to Jesus with genuine repentance and faith, he promises that he will save you. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. Let me say that again. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And what God said, he will surely do. He will save all who call upon Jesus Christ. You have his word on it. And I want you to know that, that, that the Bible that we use, this book right here, this is God-breathed. God spoke these words to us. This is His love letter to you and I. This is His map for you and I. This is His guide for you and I. This is His hope for you and I. And so when we come to places where we are struggling, we don't turn to second opinions from the world, and we don't try and find out from others what they think. We go to the Word of God. And when we don't understand what the Word of God is saying, that's what our pastor is for. That's why we find other people in the church that can help disciple us to understand and read and follow the Word of God. But I want to encourage you to read the Word of God. Number two, recognize that Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. When Jesus died on the cross, He bore our iniquities or our sins enduring God's wrath, and cried out, it is finished. John chapter 19 and verse 30. By this he meant that the full atonement of our sins, that means that the covering, the price to be paid, the atonement, he covered every sin and every act of sin. To those who will believe in Jesus Christ, his atonement is all sufficient. It doesn't just cover some sins. It doesn't cover just some sins for a period of time. It covers all sins, both in our past, our present, and our future. But I, but I want to tell you something. Please hear me. If you as a follower of Jesus Christ will begin to read His Word, develop an intimate relationship with Him, 
Find your church and establish yourself. You do not have to sin. Let me say that again. You do not have to sin. I've heard some people that have said, well, you know, everybody's going to sin a little bit every day. Well, I've got news for you. Some of us don't, and you shouldn't. There is no need for you to sin every day. The blood of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, God's Word speaking into your life, you can live a life without sinning, without going back to those old ways. His atonement has covered it. His work of redemption now complete. Our entire sin debt is paid in full. Now, let me pause for a moment to just remind you. In your relationship with Jesus Christ, as a new believer, Jesus has dealt with your sin. He's removed it as far as the east is from the west. I would point in a direction, but I have no idea where I'm at right now. But he's removed them as far as the east is to the west. He's not going to remember it anymore. However, that doesn't mean that he wipes the mind of everybody on earth about things that you've done. It doesn't mean that it automatically undone, undoes the effects of things that you've done in your past. But what it does do is this. It gives you the power to live a changed life. It gives you the ability to say, I don't want to be that person anymore. And other people may or may not believe you. I mean, look, look at the crowd. The crowd immediately talking about Jesus. Oh, look, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Really? People would look at you and say, really? You received Jesus? You of all people? Yes. And look, the evidence is not that I'm telling you. The evidence is my changed life. So I want you to know that Jesus paid it all. Number three, the great convincer. Now we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit for a moment. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. Now that's 1 John chapter 4 and verse 13. Now notice this, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. The Holy Spirit who convicted, called, and converted us also convinces us that we belong to Christ. Let me walk through that again real quickly because this is powerful. This is wonderful. The Holy Spirit is the one that drew you to Jesus. Notice what I, what, what's written here. The Holy Spirit who convicted. That's what Zacchaeus was feeling. There was conviction in his heart. He was convicted about his lifestyle, not on the outside, but the inside. And because he was convicted of it, he had to stand up and do something about it. Well, it's the same thing with us. We are convicted, and out of that conviction, we are called and out of that calling to Jesus, we are converted. We speak to Him. We admit our sins. We confess them, not just privately, but even publicly. And in doing that, we find that the Holy Spirit convinces us that we belong to Christ. It convinces us. Every morning that you wake up, He's giving you a new day. Every day that you begin to put your feet down beside the bed and begin to walk the path of that day, you can choose today, Jesus is Lord. Just as Zacchaeus said, Lord, look, here and now. You can make that same statement every day and have this confidence that because of the Holy Spirit, He's going to remind you, He's going to remind you of what Jesus said. He's going to remind you that even though you may be tempted, you don't have to give in to the temptation. He's going to remind you that you admitted that you were wrong and he's right. You're a changed life. You're a changed person. Now let's look at the new life in Christ. Ultimately, assurance is confirmed within us as we see God conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. While we will never become perfect in this life, we will experience a changed life. All who are born again will see clear evidence of a new life in Christ. But you see, you have to begin living it. You have to begin walking it. it. You feel it on the inside instantly. Oh, I know that wonderful feeling of being forgiven of heavy burdens of sin. I know what that's like, but I also know what it's like to wake up the next day and have to, have to face the reality of life and struggle sometimes getting through the day. But as you do it every day, you will grow stronger in your faith. You will grow stronger by the Holy Spirit. You will Prove both to yourself and the world around you, I have a changed life because I have a surrendered heart. What does that mean, I have a surrendered heart? 
listen to this statement. I want you to, to memorize this statement if you can. I want you to keep this statement because this statement is about you. I recognize that confessing my sins and accepting that Jesus is right and I am wrong. My new life now belongs to him alone. What has he changed in me? And specifically, what did he tell me to stop doing? What is he speaking to me to start doing? I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I will begin praying for others. So I take you to your first challenge. You've had your first lesson on a surrendered heart. You now recognize that Zacchaeus' life was changed because he was convicted, he confessed, and he made commitments to Jesus of his changed life. You, as a new believer, have done the same thing. You've recognized that being convicted on the inside about things going on in your life, you had to do something about the outside. So you confessed to Jesus. You received him as the Lord of your heart. You surrendered to him. Now you're going to get up and you're going to begin to live that new life by not doing those things you used to do, but by going out and becoming the new creature, the new life that he's made you to be. But here's one thing that he wants you to do. Notice that Zacchaeus when he stood up, the first thing that he did was for other people. I give half of what I have to the poor. There are other people that have needs. There are other people that need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And I'm going to tell you that just like he's changed your life, he can change the life of others around you. Family members, co-workers, friends. He has the power to draw them just like he drew you to convict them just like he's convicted you. But you see, someone needs to pray for those lost people. And what I'd like for you to do right now is I just want you to take a few moments of time. I want you to think of the names of five people, five people that you personally know that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now grab a pen, pencil, chalk, Crayola, mascara, whatever you have to write with. Grab that, pull it out, get a blank piece of paper. If you have the notes there, there's some spaces there for you to write this down. But I'm going to pray, and as I'm praying, I want you to write down the names of five people. Don't, you just listen to me praying, but you begin to write down the names of five people right now that you know need a changed life. They need to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking in such a wonderful way. Now I ask, Holy Spirit, that in the new believer's life, in each one of the persons that have experienced the power of change, the love of Jesus Christ, the joy of a new life, Father, I ask that you would just bring to their mind right now, Holy Spirit, speak into their mind right now, the names of five family members, five friends, five persons that you are at work in their life and you want them to begin praying for them. Father, you love them. You care about them. And without this changed life, they are going to become as destructive as we were. Father, I ask that each person right now begin to just write down those five names that's coming to their memory, that's coming to their heart, that's coming to their mind right now. As they're writing those names down, Father, I pray that you would just send the Holy Spirit not only to help them to write those names down, but send the Holy Spirit to that person and begin to deal with them. Now, if you've written down those five names, you've written down those five names, now I want you to pray with me. Now I want you, I've prayed for you, I've prayed for a spirit of revelation that God would help you to write down the names of five people. And, and, and trust me, I believe that each one of us probably know at least five people that don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You know, a lot of people say, well, I don't have any friends that are sinners. That's unfortunate because that's who Jesus hung out with. He hung out with the publicans and the sinners. That, he, was, he was coming to seek and to save those that are lost. He, he wants to save your family members. But now it's time for you to pray with me. And as I'm praying for you, I want you to just call that name out loud. That's right. I want you to say that person's name out loud. I'm not going to name any names standing up here. But I'm going to pray, and as I'm praying, I want you to follow the prayer that I'm praying. And I want you to call your friend's name out. I want you to make it vocal. I want you to make it alive. I want you to send, send the, the sources of heaven to go to them and begin dealing with them right now because they need to change life. Father, right now, just send the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for these family members right now. They are souls. They are souls that you know, that you love. And maybe some of them are looking for you, but they're hiding like Zacchaeus did. 
They're looking for you because they know that something in their life needs to change and all of the self-help books haven't worked. All of the gurus have not worked. All of the meditations and chants and music and, and, and medications, they haven't worked. And so they've heard about this man, Jesus, that is able to do miracles, that changes lives. And, and Father, but, 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 they're, but they're hiding from you. In their own personal fig trees, their sycamore trees, they're, they're hiding themselves from me. But you know the spot. You know the place to meet them. You know the very place to reach out and call their name and tell them that I want to come be at your house. Father, I just pray that you would hear these names and that you would know that we are making a commitment as a disciple of Jesus Christ to do what Jesus told us to do, and that is to pray for lost people. Pray for others to come into the kingdom of God. It's, it, it's our joy. So, Father, I just pray right now that these names that my friends have written down, the names that they've written down, Father, bring it to their memory. Every day, let them take time to pray for those names, expecting them to encounter Jesus Christ and experience their changed life because you love them. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Greg, thank you so much for letting me be with you tonight. I look forward to the next four weeks that we'll be together, continuing our lessons and developing a discipling life of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Blessings. God bless you. Thank you.